attitude is your breakthrough. Change the attitudes, change the culture. Please welcome the Strategic Planning and Performance Management Director of Palm Beach County, Keith Klinkscale. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are Great. you? Great. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Well, again, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to Your Attitude is Your Breakthrough. Well, this has been the year of pivoting. And um, we've all talked about uh, how important it is to engage your employees. Well, how do you engage your employees if everyone has a lot on their plate and their attitudes are not uh, where they need to be in order to implement some of the things that you've been trying to implement? Um, I'm tasked with trying to uh, instill the vision, mission, goals, objectives, and metrics across the entire county. But one of the things that I realized is that in order to do that, I have to not only focus on process and technology, but I have to focus on the people. So how do we do that? I heard one presenter uh, talk about positive emotions are needed for peak performance. In other words, when we begin to uh, address the issues within your organization, um, we need to understand that organizations are made up of people and people are in people's attitudes. And so what they come to the table with in order to achieve, uh, achieve peak performance, we gotta make sure that we address some of the things that are going on in terms of having a good attitude or a bad attitude. Most organization uh, operational excellence um, focus have been on process and systems process and systems, when we talk about solutions. How do we actually uh, re-engineer the process? How do we map the process? How do we change the process? How do we improve the process? We talk about Lean Six Sigma. And then we talk about technology and systems, and we do a great deal in terms of adding technology to the workplace and uh, using technology to improve our work. But do we focus on the people? Sometimes we tend to leave the people to just HR. But what I've had to do in my role as the Director of Strategic Planning and Performance Management is focus on the people. Every time I bring up metrics, every time I bring up uh, process change or performance management, I try to make sure that the people are in a good place. Because I believe if you change the attitudes, you change the people and you can change performance. So, how do we do that? We need to spend a whole lot of time, not just on process and systems, but on people development, their training, their education, their empowerment, how we reward them, and how do we focus on a good attitude? A good attitude, and how do we actually identify bad attitudes? This presentation is not only for you, but I'm hoping that you have some nuggets that you can take back to the people in your organization and begin to share. Now, I understand these are touchy subjects. I understand there's a certain way in which uh, a culture has to receive some of the things that I'm going to present today. But there are subtle ways in which you can address people's attitudes because people need to know that you care before they uh, care about what you know. I want you to think back to your 18 year old self and what would be one of the things, one of, what piece of advice would you give your 18 year old self? Now this is me at Boston University, my first uh, semester at Boston University as an engineer coming from Youngstown, Ohio and going to Boston, Massachusetts all by myself. And now that uh, I've been in my career for a number of decades, what would I go back and tell that, uh, that Keith? And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I would go back and say, Keith, if you want good performance, that's one thing. But if you want great performance, if you want the wow factor, your attitude will determine your altitude. What you walk in with can be that wow factor. 
in terms of your attitude. And I like the way this guy on LinkedIn put it. He said, I got a G, uh, 2.4 GPA my first semester in college. Thought maybe I wasn't cut off for engineering. Today I landed two spacecraft on Mars and am now designing one for the moon. He says, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is hard for everyone. Grades ultimately aren't, aren't what matters. Curiosity, perseverance, and attitude is what matters. If he would have looked at that 2.4 and said, I'm not cut off with this, he would have never been in a situation to land two spacecraft on Mars and now designing one for the moon. His attitude, being curious and being, uh, being able to persevere and endure to the end, that's what got him to where he's at today. So what are we doing at Palm Beach County? As I went through, we have about 30, 35 different departments within the county. And I came on board three years ago and they asked me to actually and still um, create a strategy, a strategic plan for the entire county. Now, imagine trying to create vision, mission, goals, objective, and metrics for 35 different departments, satisfy them and the department directors. Also, there are seven commissioners that uh, are over the seven districts of Palm Beach County. And then there's a county administrator. All of them have a say in how we do strategy and how we measure performance. Now, I said earlier that organizations are made up of groups of attitudes, groups of people. So you can imagine everyone comes to the table with a different mindset based on internal and external factors. So what did I do? I started these sessions going to the different departments, bridging the gap, breaking down silos. And every time I talked about strategy or metrics or value, core values, I talked about, do you like where you work? Do you like what you do? Um, is this an environment where you feel joyful or is it something that you dread every Monday morning? You see, what is an attitude? I had to instill in people that you can't control every situation that comes before you. We can't control, uh, we had no idea that COVID was gonna affect us this way. You can't control that. You can't control epidemics, you can't control pan pandemics, you can't control uh, uh, hurricanes. We, we're here in Florida. You can't control what's coming, but you can control how you respond and how you prepare and how you plan and how you strategize. So we started talking about what are some of the formations of attitudes. And now when I sit down with a group of people or I sit down with a department or the leadership, I'm thinking their attitudes are formed by their peers, their family, their teachers, their coaches, past experience, their religion, their region, their culture, their friends, the media, tons associated with the media these days. And all of that reinforces their attitude and how they actually perform at work. So we talk about employee engagement all the time, but how can we actually make sure that we create an environment where they thrive, that they're not just tolerated, but they're celebrated? A good attitude requires looking at the big picture. Look at this right here. It says, just do nothing. Now, changing attitudes requires helping people to see things from different perspectives and seeing the whole picture. What you see right here is just do nothing. Right here, you see just do nothing. It is impossible because somebody is just seeing one side of the wall and another one seeing the other side of the wall. But then 
if you can just get them to see the whole picture, just do it, nothing is impossible. I can't tell you how many times I've come in and anyone that works in operational excellence, there is a statement that we sort of dread, which is we've always done it that way. Or don't fix it. If, if it's not broken, don't fix it. We want people to think out of the box and realize that there's different ways and different perspectives on how to see things. Because your attitude determines what you focus your attention on. When I went to the different departments, some are focusing on aspirations, some are focusing just on the fears, the fears of the day, the fears of not being successful, the fears of being perceived the wrong way. And then some are focusing on all the things that they lack or the department lacks or they individually lack their insecurities. We have to be able to get the people to think differently. So one of the things in coaching some of the folks, I asked a question, um, do you like your job? And there are tons of folks who are willing to blame everything in the book as to why they're not successful or why they don't like their job. And this is one of the slides that I point out to them. You are responsible for your reputation, your happiness, your influence, your attitude, and your future. The other thing that I help these uh, departments do, and I encourage you to, 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 to do with your employees, is to help each individual, not just organizations, but help in each individual come up with their five-year goal, where they want to be from five, five years from now. Let that peel back the onion and say, okay, what are you going to do in 12 months? What are you going to do in three months? What are you going to do in one month? What are you going to do daily to change and to meet that five-year goal? You know why? You know why this is so important? Think about the last time you set a goal and you achieved it and what kind of attitude that brought. What kind of attitude that brought. I'll give you one uh, biblical example, if I, if, if I may. David and Goliath. Before David actually uh, slayed Goliath, he slayed a bear and a lion. So he had the attitude that he could take on anything because he had already conquered two major goals or two things prior to slaying Goliath. So help your people, help your organization set individual goals. Those goals, those five-year goals should translate all the way up into the goal of the department, the goal of uh, the division, the goal of uh, the county or the corporation. But each person's personal goals is key. The other thing that I've come across is that people have the wrong attitude about success. Now, I know I'm probably stepping on people's toes right now, but so many people believe that success is wealth, happiness, possessions, power, and achievement. But the people who are truly, truly happy in what they do, and the ones that have peak performance, they know their purpose, they're growing to meet their, they know they're growing to meet their maximum potential and they're sowing seeds that benefits others. They're speaking and they're paying it forward. They're mentoring, they're guiding, they're coaching someone else, an intern maybe. Um, but those are the right attitudes of success, knowing your purpose, growing in your potential and sowing seeds that benefits others. Seven guiding principles. I've been trying to get across to the people that I come in contact with. You see, what's great about my role is a, is a role of coach, mentor, influencer, you name it. Uh, director of strategic planning and performance management, I interface with just about every single department in the county at all levels, all the way from the, 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 uh, uh, the, the ones who, who work on the street uh, for the water utilities, engineering, 
uh, public safety, all the way to the director. So I have an opportunity to influence and speak words of life into them. And I say, go after dreams, not people. Don't compare yourself to people. Love yourself and the rest will follow. Never lose sense of a wonder, the amazement, or the things that are, 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 are uh, obtainable. You are capable than more than you know. How many people need to hear that from someone that they work for or a peer? There are no regrets in life. There are only lessons learned because so many people feel that they failed uh, and they have regrets and that actually affects their performance. Your only limit is you and life goes by in a blink of an eye. So live life to its fullest. Now, I said earlier that I asked so many people within um, Palm Beach County and I did management consulting before I came to the county. I came from the private industry. And so I had an opportunity, opportunity to work with a lot of Fortune 500, uh, Fortune uh, 1000 companies. And one of the things I realized is that people put 40 to 60 hours a week of their hour of, of, of their time a week into work. Some maybe more, maybe 80. That's an awful lot of time to give to something if you don't like it, if you don't like what you're doing. So I asked the question in all of my settings, do you like what you do? Or are you just getting by Monday through Thursday and just living for weekends and vacation? And they're open and honest about it because nobody's ever asked that question before. And then I said, well, what do we need to do to create the environment where your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday feels more like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Because you know what? You were meant to live life to its fullest Monday through Sunday, not just Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So your job and the work, I need to create an environment where you enjoy what you're doing, you are rewarded for what you're doing, and you have purpose and you have value. So how do we change attitudes? John Maxwell leadership team says, you'll never change your life until you change something you do daily, a daily routine. That's why I talked about five-year goal, bring it all the way down to the daily routine. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine. Expecting things to change without putting in any effort is like waiting for a ship at the, at the airport. I'm saying all this because yes, process and systems are important. Vision, mission, goals, objectives, strategy is all important, but you're dealing with people. These are all people who you are looking, looking to utilize in order to make things do, um, more efficient, uh, improve your culture, improve your processes, uh, manage performance. So you have to deal with the people issues, the elephant in the room, which is people unfortunately have a lot of things going on. And this COVID, uh, this pandemic has really brought that to life in terms of how do you manage all that's going on and still be effective and perform on your job. This is why it's so important to change. I said earlier that organizations and companies are made up of groups of attitudes, groups of people, groups of attitudes. If those groups of attitudes don't wanna change, don't wanna think out of the box, this is what happens. You see Netflix, some of you may not be old enough to remember Blockbuster, but Blockbuster was, was was off the chain, was, was, was a phenomenal company. But Netflix did not kill Blockbuster. Ridiculous late fees did. They refused to change. Uber did not kill the taxi business. I hear all the time, Uber's taking all the business, Uber taking all the taxis, knocking them all out. No, Uber did not kill the taxi business. Limited access and fair control did. Apple did not kill the uh, full length album um, uh, industry. Amazon, every, I, to be a shameless plug, I absolutely love Amazon. I can get whatever I want tomorrow. Order today, get it tomorrow. But I say that because Amazon did not kill all the retail retailers. Poor customer service and experience did. Airbnb, another one. Refusing to change your attitude will yield missed opportunities. 
relate all of that back to peak performance within your organization. Groups of attitudes that you want to change so that you have peak performance. Success doesn't come from what you do occasionally, but what you do consistently. You can't con con uh, uh, occasionally have a workshop on employee engagement or um, uh, offer your employees uh, uh, a workshop and think that that's going to change the attitude. You have to be intentional and consistent about how you want to create the environment in which you want people to perform. You can't, and it's a challenge. You can't spell challenge without change. If you're going to rise to the challenge, you have to be prepared to change. And here's the thing. We talk about employee engagement. We talk about uh, getting uh, employees on board, uh, happy about what they do. And sometimes we abdicate all of that to HR. But you as leaders have a role to play because you're spending the most time with these people. So you're the ones who want, need to sit down and show that you care, you value them, um, you understand that there's some other things that they're dealing with at home that sometimes translate into their work. Now, with COVID, I call this the COVID factor. Boredom. Boredom can cause a bad attitude. So I pass this on to, to my kids. I pass it on to everybody I come, can't come in contact with even here at work. Here are things to do when you are bored. Because I know if you are, especially you know, with COVID, everybody was locked in, um, everybody was locked down. They really couldn't socialize the way they used to. They couldn't get together with family. And so you have to figure a way to pivot and do things differently and relieve some of the boredom. Because if you do, then when you come to work, you won't be so edgy and you'll be able to do, you'll be able to perform at a higher, a, a higher level if you address it. Good attitude ingredients, laugh, party, which I mean celebrate, travel, see things, think, advise people, care and love, care and love. Laugh, celebrate, travel, think, advise, care and love. These are some things that promote a healthy and really, really good attitude. I like this because it basically says, um, I'll read it. Children laugh 400 times a day. Adults laugh 15 times a day. Now, I, read, I had this discussion with some coworkers and, and I asked them, I said, how? Is there any laughter in your department? Does anyone laugh? And 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 uh, one department said we laugh all the time. We always have a good time. We always laugh. Another department, who tends to have a revolving door, says we 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 really ever laugh. It's you know it's, they're wondering if if, if there's a, a a couple of us laughing in the hall or something. They're wondering why we're not getting any work done. What environment do you want? What environment do you have? I actually put in your chat, do you laugh? Do, is your laughter in your work environment? All of this is so important because I thought about quitting, but then I noticed who was watching. Our attitudes have influence, it's contagious. You have a bad attitude, bad vibes, it, create, it changes the entire environment in which you work. Now, how are you going to implement a new process or a new piece of technology where everyone is having problems with each other and have a bad attitude. It's contagious. Bad apples are contagious. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. So we have to address some of it. So what do we do? There's something called emotional intelligence, emotional quotient. It says, have control, self-control of your emotions. Be willing to think about alternatives and delete and cancel any and everything that comes in that are unhealthy. This all creates better relationships. That's your emotional quotient. Now, John Maxwell 
So we all, we've all heard of uh, the intelligent quotient, IQ. There's the EQ, which is basically your emotions, uh, emotional quotient, which is how do you actually relate with people? Uh, are you control over your emotions? Do you, you know, have alternatives? Do you delete uh, negative situations? But then John Maxwell, the, 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 uh, the famous uh, leadership coach, says there should be an AQ, which is an attitude quotient. That's your wow factor when you come in the door, when you walk in the door. It's like, I just love being around that person. That, he always has, always has a great attitude. Always has a great attitude. Could you imagine if you had an organization where everyone's walking, it's like, hey, you know, let's do, we can do this. We can do just about anything. What you allow in your head, I'm saying this because these are things for you, but also what you can actually begin to coach, mentor those who work for you, work with you um, sensitively. I mean, obviously, you know, in these days and age, you, we have to be sensitive with our messages, but um, these are some of the things that I, that I actually use and I, I coach and mentor. Don't let anyone rent space in your head unless they are a good tenant. We tend to let too much in our head, too much coming in that acts to give us a bad attitude about people, about things, about new nuances, about new things coming down the pike, about opportunities. So I tell people, have good thoughts only. To the extent that you can have good thoughts only. Be willing to let some things go and some people go and some processes go. And so, you know, we had a conversation um, about, for those of you who are in city and in, uh, in county governments, I'm sure you've heard of the agenda item process. And um, since I've been here, I've heard so much about the agenda item process. And I've really been trying to uh, coach and encourage automating the agenda, agenda uh, um, item process. And it's difficult because working in government, there are legacies and there are things been, that have been done forever the same way. So as a process improvement person, operational exit person, always looking for a way to automate or streamline or remove eight forms of waste or implement lean or Six Sigma, um, some of these concepts are foreign. And so I tell people, guys, listen, stop giving CPR to dead situations, dead solutions, dead ways of doing things. Be willing to let some things go. Now, I specifically put this in here because what people tend to see, these are the things that, that tend to lift people's spirits. Things, things here, okay? This is what people see. The people that work for you, the people that you want to implement metrics and vision and be on board for all the things that you want to do in terms of process improvement and Lean Six Sigma and, and teams and all that, they're dealing with all of these things. They're dealing with some of these things. And you know, we, we can take the attitude that, well, that's not our problem, or, or I'm not dealing with people's sleepless nights or uh, their expenses or their you know, uh, time management or their rejection issues. But the problem is, is that, like I said, organizations are made up of groups of people. And if you truly want peak performance, you have to have some way of dealing with these things. Now, what I love about our um, EAP organization here, uh, Employee Assistance Program, every morning they send out to all 6,700 employees a, a um, daily uh, uh, encouragement uh, quote, famous quote, uh, daily inspiration. It's called daily inspiration. Who does that? I mean, that's phenomenal. I, I love that. I've never seen that in my years of working with, uh, of, uh, with, with companies, anyone in a company that does that. But we do that here because we realize that people are dealing with stuff and we need to encourage and inspire them. Now, one of the things I realized that a lot of people deal with is the fact that they never feel appreciated and they never feel like uh, anybody encourages them. One thing that I've had to learn, now, 
I'm like I said, I'm responsible for strategic planning and performance management. So anytime a department sees me coming, they're thinking I want their metrics or I want to see their metrics or I want to talk about their metrics or ask why the metrics aren't going in the wrong direction. So I don't get a lot of love. Okay. So um, I've had to learn to pat myself on the back. You got to know that you're doing what you came to do and pat yourself on the back. And I tell everybody, listen, you know, don't be discouraged about um, the fact that no one's rewarding you or patting you on the back or telling you you're doing a great job. You just got to know in your heart that you put it all out there and you did a great job and you pat yourself on the back. Stop waiting for others to celebrate you, set goals, achieve them, and clap for yourself. And then we all experience uh, adversity. If there's a Goliath, if there's something, some major obstacle in your way, that means there's a David inside of you. And I use that. I, I tell people that, hey, you know, I may get in trouble, but I tell people that. It's like, listen, that obstacle that's in your way, that means that you have what it takes to, to, to get past that obstacle. You are built for it. Adversity introduces a person to themselves and tells you what you are made of. So I tell folks, there are 10 things that don't, don't cost you anything. Just do these things, these top 10 things that require zero tolerance. Uh, have the right attitude of being on time, showing people you're making an effort, being high energy, have a positive attitude, being passionate about what you do. Use good body language. Every time, you know, when somebody's speaking or someone's giving you coaching, just like, yes, show some good body language. Be coachable. No matter what level you're in, tell people, tell, I, you know, I tell you, employ you to talk to your folks, to be coachable. Always be willing to learn. Do a little extra. Be prepared and have a strong work ethic. Come in, knock it out. You know, they used to say, Get there before your boss and leave after your boss. What else? I also tell people to be authentic. I asked uh, 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 a mentor once, I said, what is your secret? What would you get? What, what, what piece of information would you give to employees? What one piece of information? He said, keep it 100. Embrace who you are, your gifts, your talents, and be authentic. Don't try to be someone else. And I remember... Um, funny, I have a, I had my first dog name was Ubu. And that was a daily reminder to me because Ubu was spelled U-B-U. And that was a daily reminder, keep, be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. You, be you and be good at it because nobody can beat you at being you. I've also had to talk to a lot of people about living a life of no regrets. Don't regret anything. Just learn from it. You fail forward. You don't fail backward. You fail forward. So there's no regrets. You know, there's no regrets of not speaking up enough, failure to take risks, not meeting people enough, staying too long. You know, this is kind of like doing a uh, SWOT analysis of yourself. I tell people, do a SWOT analysis of yourself. Look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, and, and work on them and fix them. But don't live a life of regrets. Leverage your strengths, um, address every weakness, seize every opportunity, and mitigate every threat. That's your own SWOT analysis. 39, um, show people you care, show compassion. Create an environment, your work environment, where everybody uh, shows compassion. People are dealing with a lot with this COVID. Show some compassion. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, it's kind of hard to push all of this through, all, you know, improvement, technology, systems, all of that through. And people are dealing with the fact that they have loved ones who are sick or they, have, they may have had loved ones who died of COVID. Are you showing that level of compassion in your organization? I know this is Performance Institute. We talk about performance and all that, but there's a people side to this. And if you get it right, the people will be
be there forever and be forever loyal. Treat employees, treat people and yourself like they make a difference and they will. Treat employees, people and yourself like they make a difference and they truly will. I say this all the time, and most of you, have, I'm sure, have heard this. Think outside of the box, but then I take it. I say, I take, I take it a step further and say, think like there is no box. You know, be so innovative in your thinking, because I run across this all the time. It's like, well, why do we do it this way? Well, we've always done this this way. Well, what if we did this? Well, I don't know if that'll work. Well, can we try? You know, performance improvement is you, you got to change their attitude. It's like they're so caught up in the same old routine, in the same box. It's like, oh no, how, how do we get past that? Leap and grow your wings on the way down. I heard um, Les Brown say this, and I had to capture it. He said, because everything is possible. He says, some things will require you to just take a leap of faith. And then while you're going down, you gain your wings and fly and, and then take off. Some things you, you know, I encourage employees to do is like, listen, you know, you, you have no growth with no risk. So let's take a leap of faith. Let's try this. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least we tried it and we'll learn as we go. That's basically grow your wings on your way down. It's not the skills that you don't have that limits you. It's the skills you think you need. I always wanted to write a book. I was like, I don't have a skill set for that. I see all these book, people writing books and uh, these last four years in the uh, administration, everybody came out with a book. I'm like, how in the world did they come out with a book so fast? I've been trying to write a book for 50 years. And it's like, but it's not the skills that I don't have that limits me. It's what I think I need because those things needs change. I mean, there's, there's ghostwriting, there's all kinds of ways in which to accomplish something now. So don't limit yourself. Think positive all the time. So some people represent the thoughts you have rejected for yourself. I'm just gonna let that sit down, sit there. Some people represent, when you see them, they represent the things that you have rejected for yourself. I see people writing these books and I'm like, that represents what I have rejected or said to myself that I could not do. And that, that gives me a little sense of failure. So then I was like, nope, cancel, cancel. I'm going to write a book. So how has this changed my work and what we've done at Palm Beach County. It allowed me to get total agreement from seven commissioners, a county administrator, 35 plus departments. Within those departments, there are divisions. Each department has multiple divisions. And then ultimately 60, 6,600 people, employees. And we represent 1.5 million residents in Palm Beach County. So how do we get all that under? We were able to get a new vision, new vision, think strategically and anticipate the future. Ensure that decisions we make today will have lasting value. We have our mission to drive continuous improvement culture, attitude of excellence that achieves measurably high level of public satisfaction. We have our core values, and then we have six strategic priorities. That encompasses, puts it all in perspective. But in order to do these things, I have to have people who are motivated, who have great attitudes, who love where they work, who want to do good, who want to excel, who don't live a life of regrets. So where do we come from? And I heard a speaker, one of the speakers talked about this. He said, silo busting. We had to bust some silos. Because when I came on board, I met with all plus 35 departments and I said, I did a SWOT analysis and I asked, what's the, what's the major problem we have within the county? What's, what's, I said, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The major weakness they said was that we operate in silos. Every department does fantastic work, really good work. But 
the departments do not work well together. They're all buying for themselves. So how do we actually take the silos and bring convergence? And we have what we call, and you guys have heard it, county stat. I call it county stat. Um, but I've also formed for each strategic priority a cross department team, team. Meaning if this housing and homelessness is an issue, then community services needs to be on the team. Uh, Department of uh, Housing and Economic Stability needs to be on that team. Youth services needs to be on that team. Uh, you name it. Each one of the six strategic priorities pulls in the, the, the appropriate department out of the 35 to be on a team. And now those teams actually drive the vision and mission goals objective in the strategic priorities. But every time I kicked off a team, I talked about, do you like where you work? Do you have good attitudes? How can we make it so that your Monday through Thursday looks just as good as your Friday through Saturday? We did a lot of icebreakers. We did a lot of celebrating. We did a lot of uh, brainstorming and we were open and honest. And this is what we got, changing attitudes, infrastructure cross department team. This is right out of the, one of the uh, board, count, board of County Commissioners presentations where each team presented. That is the cross department team picture for infrastructure. Substance use and behavior disorders, cross department team. Now again, this is sort of the end result. But what you don't see are all the training sessions and all the kickoffs and the icebreakers that I did with this material that I'm sharing with you today. They got these folks to smile and work together like that. Substance use, housing the homeless. Yes, we still have the metrics. We still have the vision, mission goals, and objectives, but we have people, we focused on the people. Economic development, cross department team. These are just some of the metrics. We just highlight, put some of the metrics. Each team has like a full mission statement and, and set of metrics, but now they're common goals and common um, values and they're working together like they've never worked before. We said, we, we, we basically said, I said, we're going from good to great. And then the county ministry said, no, we've already been, we've already been good. She said, we're going from great to a culture of, culture, attitude, culture of excellence. So we kick off everything with, we're going from great to a culture of excellence. Environmental protection, cross department team. And the public safety, cross department team. I leave you with this. Remember, changing attitudes changes people. When you change the people, you change performance to peak performance, to a culture of excellence, and you ultimately change the culture systemically forever. Mary, that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them.